comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim, and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. So that brings us to our first praise hymn. I love to tell the story, number 297. And we'll do all three. Oh, 
saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, and with her colt by her, and tie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. So it comes time for a second praise hymn and future prayer requests the center, and I'll be out to pick those up. We're going to sing 188 at the cross, and let's do the first and last verse of that one. So, prayer requests for this morning are we have pray for Pat. He keeps falling. He's already fallen twice today. Um, prayer for good results for Judy's test on Monday and Tuesday. And prayers for Alice Plate. Alice has been diagnosed with Parkinson's dementia. So, you'll be in our prayer, Alice. Larry. Thank you. So, um, <coughs> so, as we come into the time of communion, our communion song is going to be Softly and Tenderly, number 326. Let's do the first and last verse of that. <laughs>
I came home, pulled into the driveway, and there's this nice truck sitting in my driveway, all rusted out and white. Even says I love bluegrass on the back window. <laughs> my old truck. And I noticed there's bags tied around the mirrors. I thought, what is going on with my truck? And Kim, again, now she says, did you notice your truck? It's got bags on the mirrors? Yeah. Well, apparently the Cardinals thought the sweet gum tree beside my truck would be a good place to build a nest. <laughs> but they keep seeing the reflection in the mirrors on my truck. And so they were tacking on mirrors all day long. So Kim put that on the back. Well, then the rear window of the truck is kind of mirrored, finished, it's tinted. So they started attacking the back glass. It was either that or they're trying to get the I love bluegrass sticker off the back of the truck. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but I'm watching this cardinal out there just beating their head against the glass. And I thought, you know, there's something to be learned in everything. I think there's a lot of times we look at our own reflection in the mirror and we start beating our head against the glass. Fighting ourselves instead of allowing something to cover that, to block all those images from us. And there's a time when we come together every Sunday where we get that covering. The covering of the blood of Jesus Christ. Blocking us from our sins. Helping us forget that reflection that we see in the mirror. Seeing who we truly are. Just not some vain apparition that appeared among us. So as we come in to take communion today, I just want us to remember that covering that is given. And we're here to celebrate this. No matter how somber and just hard to believe what Christ went through for us, with the beatings and the scourging and all stuff, it's hard as humans sometimes just celebrate that fact of what traumatic experience he went through. But we must celebrate it because that's why he did it. So we can live. So we celebrate the risen Lord. That tomb is empty. He's there. And we know from Sunday school this morning, he fulfilled all the promises of the Old Testament as the Messiah. Therefore, you hold truth to the fact he will be coming a second time. And that's what we're celebrating. His love to us. Father God, we thank you so much for the grace we don't deserve, for your mercy and your forgiveness. None of us are worthy, Lord. We read that in Scripture. None of us are. But you love us. You love us unconditionally as a father loves a child. Remember, Lord, when I first saw my daughter, how much I loved her right after she was born and I didn't even know her. And we know that is the love you have for us. It's unconditional. Sure, there's times, Lord, we mess up. And we must be disciplined. That's why you discipline us, because you love us so much. You do not want to see us to be failed. And Lord, I can never comprehend that gift that you would just go lay down your life for everyone. Even those who hate you, you laid your life down for them. And we ask you, Lord, at this time, be with those who aren't here. Be with those who are home. Be with those who just can't seem to find their way back to you. And be with those who claim you do not exist. Be with the leaders of the countries in our own country. Direct our government to come back to you, to do what is right, to seek you first in their decisions. We ask for you, Lord, to come and end all this strife, war, and make things the way they were meant to be. The life that you see for us, that eternal life. We come to praise you, honor you, and glorify you, Lord. We thank you for your sacrifice. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, I have I've thought so much. Oops. <laughs> I've thought so much in the last several weeks about, uh, you know, who.
who we are and, and what we do and such. And last week we, we went to the men's fellowship and that was a, a great time because the very thing that we're talking about here in, in remembering, and isn't this the, the main thing that we want when we take the bread, is we want to remember. Well, I had the privilege of remembering some individuals, and they're here this morning. Uh, Larry and Sarah Lee Moore, uh, and Larry and Sarah Lee lived in Galesburg at the time, and uh, believe it or not, they are the ones that are responsible for me living in Illinois. <laughs> because they were on, Larry was on the committee from the hospital and from the, from the church there when I was called as the chaplain. And you know, one of the things that made me so happy was that I could remember. My life, my, my night changed when I saw Larry. But you know, one of the things that is so important to me as your minister is that when I partake of this bread, I change. There's something different that happens inside me spiritually, mentally, and so on when I partake of the Lord's Supper because it continually reminds me of the love that Jesus Christ and God have for me and for you. Today, as we partake of this bread, I want you to remember of the love that Christ has for you. Because when he took this bread, he simply gave us this very simple instruction, as often as you eat it, you do so in remembrance of me. And really the same thing when we think of the cup. I know that Rex has given you a, a great devotion for this morning, <coughs> but I want to take it one step further. I can remember the first time I, I saw one who received a, a blood donation or gave a blood donation and what it meant. It meant life was coming to one where death was real. And in a way, that's the promise that God gives to us, isn't it? He said, you remember this. I have given that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. When you partake of this, do so in remembrance of me. Concerned about this, this thing that dropped out of me, but I, I want you to know I have this thing on me this morning, I have this thing on me this morning, and I have my phone in my pocket, and I, I don't know what's going to happen. If something <laughs> rings today, I don't I even have any idea who I'm going to be talking to. Uh, so if any of you want me to finish quickly, please don't call, just leave. <laughs> no, 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 don't even do that. But uh, I, I'm so grateful uh, for this morning and for the, really for the things that have taken place uh, within our country and within our society this, the last several weeks. Have, have, how have the rest of you felt about, about what we hear on the news? Now, I realize that for the last couple of weeks I've, I've talked about the news, and I, but it's still an important thing, isn't it? When we're listening to the people. And when we're, when we're watching these individuals, for instance, in the Ukraine, and here, you know, here's a young woman carrying a baby, and they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know what's on the agenda next at all. And yet they find themselves in a position of really continuing with their life. I, I like what I have heard of those that have left now have begun to come back to the Ukraine. Now, political possibly, but no, it's just how important that is uh, to them as individuals. And as you notice, the, the title of the message this morning is simply this, in light of his return, 
be prepared. What are we talking about? We're talking about the return of Christ. And we begin to look at, at the New Testament. In, in Matthew 24, we find a lot of different ideas that are coming forth in this chapter. Because Christ has gone. He's left. And he's now going to return. And it's for a specific purpose. Now, maybe none of you ever have a lot of family coming. But this last week, Mitzi had... Mitzi and I had uh, my youngest daughter that came. And the thing that was the hardest for us is to know that she was coming and to be prepared because she had not been to our home for, what, honey, six or seven years or more. Now, that's a long time. So you can say, okay, be prepared. And what's one of the things you got to prepare? Well, you got to make the bed. So we made sure that the bed was made, that the sheets were clean, that the types of food that she liked was all, that, those are the things that we had. And in a way we were disappointed because really she needed more than what we were able to give her at that point. And I began to think about what we have in our relationship to Christ, our relationship to God. Because isn't this the statement that he is making He's saying, I want you to be prepared. And the, because of the question, and I think all of us have, <coughs> have thought about this, certainly we did in Sunday school this morning, it's almost the idea that we're saying, are these the last days? Now, I'm not up here this morning to, to make a, a prophecy. I'm not here to try to make anyone nervous. But possibly to, to help you understand what may be coming about. And the whole idea in this is this last, these last two words in this, number one, be prepared. I always liked that when I was a Boy Scout because that was the motto, wasn't it? Have any of you fellows ever been a Boy Scout? Oh, I got what a scout over here. And it was what? Be prepared, wasn't it? I, it's too bad that we didn't have that said that just come right along in our lives as individuals. I want to talk to you about a few individuals and some statements uh, that they have made. A fellow by the, by the name of Elliot Jamaway made this comment. And he was, an, he was an internationally known economist. And he said, humanly speaking, and internationally known as we look at this, humanly speaking, for the first time in my life, I am afraid. Have any of you ever been afraid? Are any of you, I'm not even going to ask you to shake your head, but are you afraid now? I will, I will shake mine and I'll say, I'm, I'm a little bit afraid as to what's taking place. Then there's another person, and I know you, you have heard of this name, it's Linus Pauling. Maybe you've heard of this, but he was a Nobel Prize winner and several years ago. And he, here's the statement that he makes. The greatest Catastrophe in the world will occur within 25 to 50 years. And you know where we are in, the, in that, that measure? We're on year 19. So someplace the prediction that Pauling is making is important. And then another person by the name of Dr. Margaret Weed, as we're, or Mead by Weed, and you've all heard of her too, I'm sure, uh, as she talks. She says, she was an anthropologist, and she was asked uh, really the question, are you going to survive the major struggle of marriage? It's only who takes out the garbage. That's the only person that's going to survive marriage. Does it matter who takes it out if, you, if we are not going to be here, she says? Are we going to be here? And she says, it is very doubtful that we will. The whole world is in terrible danger. We could go tonight. Have you ever thought of that? We could go tonight. Now, what, what is the Christian response as we look at this, as we look at the, the predictions that have been made in, in recent years to these, I, I would almost say doomsayers, people that know that something is going to happen. And, and looking at these last days, 
because we look at the different events that are taking place and we begin to think, even in the limited knowledge that we have as far as the Bible is concerned and some of the statements that we have biblically, of saying, you know, we don't know when that is going to happen, but it could happen really at, at any time. And the scripture, when it uses the word the last day, is referred to a period of time between the first and the second coming of Christ. And we find this is, this is really an important uh, matter, the period between this first and coming. Well, what about this second coming? We find so many places, for instance, in the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 1, we find a statement here by the Apostle Paul that is, is really an, an interesting statement regarding uh, the second coming. And then also we find in the book of Romans, and I'm going to read a couple of these, but first of all, in the book of 2 Timothy, uh, we find uh, these words, see if I can get it exactly uh, right, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, it says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited lovers of pleasure rather than the lovers of God. Isn't, isn't that a, a scary passage of scripture when it begins to describe uh, who we are or what's going to happen uh, within our lives? And then the other passages that we find, I, I want to read also from uh, from the book of Romans, uh, and uh, by the way, the reason I'm having trouble is I have a new Bible here, and so uh, I haven't gotten all the all of my finger things all all ready to go here. But in, in the book of Romans, uh, chapter thirteen, uh, we find a specific statement regarding uh, the future, and beginning uh, this particular passage. Uh, would be uh, in chapter 13, verse 11. And here's what uh, we find this particular uh, statement saying. And do this, understanding. Excuse me, that's verse 13. That's 11. Yeah. Do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first Believe. And you think of what this means and how it talks to us as individuals. The sense that, that is there. Now, as Christians, we have something that is extremely important. And my, my message this morning would simply be this, the matter of being prepared. In the scripture of the last days that the, 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 that the Bible is talking, it is this period of time. But scripture has also, as it really speaks uh, in uh, many ways of a specific period, doesn't it? Talks about the last days. And when the scripture talks about that, he's very specific. And we find again, this in the book of Timothy. And Timothy is talking about this in, uh, in the second chapter of Timothy, beginning with, verse, uh, with chapter three and, and verse one. And I really love this, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. That one that I've already used. The fact that here people will be lovers of themselves. Isn't this something we begin to identify? What, what do we find? Not the reaching out as far as love is concerned to one another. Jesus referred to this as we look at it, as in it of the beginning of sorrow when he's talking about this. In, in Matthew 24, 5, the passage that, that I have used as, as the scripture this morning, it means, when, when we use the word sorrow, it means travel or travial, T-R-A-V-I-A-L, as we're talking about, or labor pains, what it means that's going to take place. It indicates a nearness as we look at it, a nearness of birth. I know all of you have experienced it by watching or maybe yourself uh, a birth and so on. But here we find Jesus is saying that this, that this is the one of the cycles, the revelation that I'm going to make and the revolution will come more closely to you as an individual and more often. And we see all of these things happening, don't we? The hurting, 
the, the times when we really are afraid, all of these things, and we look at it. Someone said, if old Mother Earth were a human mother, she might be on her way to the hospital right now, and indicating that there are things that are occurring which are threatening individuals and threatening our future. And the application, as we begin to look at this, we begin to look at chapter 24 of the book of Matthew, and I'll be using quite a few scriptures here. There was a fellow by William Miller who was, who was a, just, he was a member of, of the church, and his statement that he was made was a student of, of the scripture, and, and during the uh, 18th, 18th century, it was based on, on the study of the Bible that he made a prediction, as a lot of people had, that Christ would return between March the 21st, 1842, and March 21st, 1843. That prediction was made. Have any, have any of you ever heard of an individual that, that would make this prediction? And you know, a number of years ago, this prediction was made by a group of individuals from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And all of the things that were happening were so interesting in their making an effort to prepare for the date that they had selected as, as the time that, that Christ was going to return. And also in, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, or the beginning of, of this particular church, the, the, a camp meeting was held in, in Philadelphia. <coughs> with the Seventh -day, well, as before the Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, began. Sometime later, one of the followers of, of this individual, when he had made this prediction, uh, looked away and, and he said uh, that at, a, at this meeting that uh, all of the followers announced as to when Jesus was going to come. And he was going to come on October the 22nd of 1844. Well, the were individual that predicted this died five years later. And of course, uh, that hadn't occurred at all. But the very thing that you find, and here's what, here's what the, the newspapers were saying at that time. It simply said, shops were closed, farmers abandoned their field, and 200 people left Philadelphia to wait for the return of Jesus. Isn't that an interesting thing? When we look at and we think about the predictions that are made. And the thing is, we, we know, or the statement that we find in the scripture is what? Jesus is going to come back. And what does he say about that? Nobody knows. And if we look at the scriptures, if we, look, if we begin to look at these passages of scripture in the book of Matthew, and also in other passages, one of the statements is simply this. I'll just put it in English as we know it. Nobody knows. Not the angels. And the interesting thing is, not even Jesus doesn't know, didn't know when he was going to return. Only God. And so what is, he, what is he trying to give us here? What is he trying to prepare for us? Have, have any of you ever uh, been in a spot where you waited for someone to come to your house? I remember when, when I was a little kid and lived in Saginaw, Michigan, and we lived on Harrison Drive. It was about a three block long lane and there were only two houses on the end of this lane. And my grandma and grandpa Allie were going to come from Indianapolis, Indiana. And we didn't know exactly what time or when they were going to get there that day. Do you know what we did? My sisters and my brothers and I, we went down at seven o'clock in the morning to the end of the lane right there by what then was called Gratiot Avenue, and there was a little restaurant there called Bess and Jeans, and we waited there until 9 o'clock that night for Grandma and Grandpa to get there. But you see, we stayed. Why? Because we knew they were going to come. When is Christ going to return? What is the statement that he is making here? Going back to this Boy Scout idea, be prepared for the return of Jesus Christ and what it means. And as we begin to see this, every generation, as we look at it, really has its share of, of impatient and restless people who forecast the imminent return of Christ. 
I mean, we've even heard these recently with all of the things that are taking place throughout the world. I heard a person on the radio yesterday, and I don't remember exactly who it was. I just accidentally turned to it. Somebody says, the Lord is returning next year. He gave a date. <coughs> That's an interesting thing that he would make that, that comment. But as I look at that, I think, is he really going to come? I want to ask you, is he really going to come? Larry, is Jesus coming next year? I don't know. And that's the thing. What, what do I want to find? I want this very part of the title of this message to be prepared, be ready for it. My life has to be exactly what Christ wanted it. The expectation that was there and here in the book of Matthew is the very essence that we want to look at uh, this morning. I, so in, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like for you to turn to, to chapter 24 and let's look at verse 36. And here's what the statement uh, begins to say. It says, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son." What's the end of it? But only the Father. And then in verse 42 and 44, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the chief was coming, he would have kept watch and would, have not, would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour where you do not expect him. And that, as we look at it, is really the essence of this whole passage that we have in this 24th chapter of the book of Matthew. Now, we find a little story that appeared in Time magazine a number of years ago. It reported that in 1800, religious mystical cults had emerged, these are the words, in recent years, recruiting over 20 million people in America alone. Over 1,100 different people have climbed, claimed publicly to be the Messiah in the last 50 years. Have you ever heard of anyone that claimed to be the Messiah? I have. Maybe by the, some, of the, some of the individuals that are evangelists on TV now. It's almost, I am the Messiah, so be ready. Everything is going to happen and what it means. Islam, when we begin to think about it, is the fastest growing religion that we have within the world at this particular time. And we see the apostrophe, the professing of the church, and an outbreak, really, of Satanism and persecution of faithful Christians. And you've, you've noticed this, and I, I've kind of mentioned it a couple of times in the last couple of weeks. Have you noticed those individuals that are against Christianity? There was one newscaster this last week which, which just broke my heart as she began explaining some significant event that had taken place nationally and she started talking about Jesus Christ and God. An hour later, another news person said, this woman had no right to talk about that at all, to even mention what had taken place. And when you think, isn't this a sad thing of what it means to us as individuals and the, the, the events that are taking place? At that day, no one knows, not even the angels and so on. And I want to quote, make another quote. It is wrong to get involved in some preparation like quitting our job, storing food in the hills so you can go there and when things look bad and wait on Jesus. It would also be wrong to spend all of your time reading prophecies and charting events, trying to determine the day of our Lord that he will return. That takes an attention from what the scriptures tell us to be doing to withstand the spiritual pressures of the last days that we must be, we must be mentally alert to be able to take care of these things. The nearer, and in a sense, look, the nearer we seem that we come to the event, the more really that we should expect Satan's aggressive attempts to fool us, to see that we don't understand that there's a season that he he's going to return. 
And this will be characterized as we look at there's several things that I want to point out. Number one, it's going to be faith. And then secondly, false prophets. There's going to be these false prophets. And in Matthew 5, 24, that, sta that very statement uh, is made. That something is going to happen. And in the 24th verse of, of this particular chapter, they are going to predict that the world is going to come to an end. And in CBS, we find these words very simply. We are living in, an, in a time of cult mania and psychic boom. And over 40 million Americans consult their horoscope every day. And you have, how many how many of you look at, ever look at your horoscope? Well, I admit I do. How's that? Not very often. Once in a while, when I, I kind of have an empty day, I look at it and see what I should have been doing. <laughs> and I find out that I did not do it. And so I guess I was in bad shape. But the whole thing is the, the false prophecies that come as, and to try to worry or try to get somebody prepared. And then the second was in, in verses 6 and 7 here in this, in this 24th chapter uh, of Matthew, we find uh, these particular statements. You will hear of wars. Uh oh and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. And in verse 7, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pain. Now, if you were to look at so much of what's happening in our world now, what would you say? The world is going to be coming to an end. What well, we know it is eventually. But the thing is that we don't know exactly when that's going to take place. More people have, when you stop and think of more people have been killed in wars in the 20th and the 21st century than all of history uh, uh, combined. And the news that we find is simply this. It reported that there has been continued warfare somewhere on the planet since 1945. Somewhere. And it's still there. We begin to see this. And we find exactly what's it. In just 12 years, we begin to look at this. To grow from 4, million, 4 billion people to 5 billion people. 20,000 people die every single day from starvation around the world. 600 million children worldwide go to bed hungry every night. And think of these things that are taking place. And of course, we think about earthquakes. It's talking about those. Even biblically, there's some mention of these. And we, we've all heard of or know of some of the earthquakes that have happened. But then lawlessness. In verse 12, here in this passage of, of Matthew, we find these words, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end, you know what the last word is? Will be saved. He who stands firm there at the end will be saved. And we see this, how, how important it is. We think of the amount of crime, you know, since the pandemic that has taken place, all of the events worldwide, <laughs> And every, every place we go, every, every city we think of, every country, this whole thing is always being uh, talked about. It took about 12 years for the, for the world, companies to grow, but 20,000 people, and we see all of these changes that are taking place. The crime in America is so great as we look at it right now. In fact, is if you look at it, it increased 300% in adolescence just this last year, 300%. Now that's a lot of lawlessness as we, as we begin to think about it. And in fact, if we look at some other things, and this really bothers me uh, because, you know, having been associated with hospitals and, and, and doctors and so on over the years, but it's a very simple thing that if we look at, America will kill over 4,000 babies every year day. 4,000 babies because of what's taking place, because of abortions. 
30 times the number of Americans that are lost in the wars. And we think of what this means. God, I believe God hates the hands that, that, that shed innocent blood. And we find this in the book of Proverbs, the statement that is made there. And then we think of worldwide evangelism. Now, I, I've, I've dealt now with ne all this negative stuff, but now I want, to, I want to show you something else. Now, all of you have heard a fellow, heard of, have you ever heard about a fellow by the name of Billy Graham? Oh, yeah. Everybody heard of him? But here, here's Billy Graham. And you, you think of what took place during his life and ministry as, as an evangelist. And it's very simply this. The statement that I found uh, in some history was Billy Graham speaks to more people in one broadcast than Paul did in his lifetime. Isn't that an amazing thing? That he was able to do that. And in a way, our churches in the history of our country are speaking to more people every single Sunday than Paul talked to in his whole lifetime, in his whole ministry. And we think the Foreign Mission Board of, of a number of Protestant churches uh, report a database of 3.8 million uh, or billion of the Earth's 5.1 billion people have already been evangelized. And how important this is. And all of us, and we, we support missions. Nipsey and I were in Africa a number of years. And we find all of these things that have taken place in Europe and Africa and Asia and in Mexico and South America and all over the world. And what's the, what's the reason? And I think it really covers this in here. Say so this is a product that we must have as individuals in the evangelizing of, of the rest of the world. We have 2,000 agencies in missions pursuing the remaining people that never heard of Jesus Christ. And you know, that's, that's pretty hard. You think of what, how this message is going around, whether it's by radio or print or whatever it happens to be, people know. And <laughs> this bothers me when I do this. You know, and sometimes I wake up at night, as Mitzi knows, and uh, I, I wake up and well, I can't go back to sleep, so I turn on the television. And invariably, I turn on to some particular channels that are having a, a church program or a minister that's giving a message that I don't agree with or that he is yelling and screaming and people are dancing and they're laying hands on people and raising their hands and all of these things that are happening. And I, I said, I think I'm going to go back to sleep. So I turn the television off. And you know what? I always feel guilty when I do that. I think, does God want me to listen to this? Does he want me to do it? But think about what's taking place in our world where people hear about Christ and they hear about God in so many different ways uh, within uh, their lives. How important it really is. In fact, it's in 1948, and this is a hard thing to, to really visualize, but in 1948, China had approximately one million Christians. You know how many they have today? Approximately 100 million Christians in that short period of time. It's estimated that 178,000 people a day trust Jesus worldwide. And then we think about Israel. We think about the statements that are made about Israel in the scripture. And what, it, what Matthew is saying in verses 28 and, and 29. Listen, listen to these particular uh, statements that we have. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies uh, will be shaken. And we find what we find, what we see here. Here's Israel being changed. And we think of this and what it means for us as individuals. Symbolically, as we look at this, I think it means that there was a curse on Israel because of spiritual barrenness. And in a way, I don't, maybe you agree, maybe you don't, but I believe that there is a, something that is going to happen to our country, to our world as we now know it, because of spiritual barrenness. Because Christ is not being preached in a way that is true. Are, we are not using the scripture. And I, I, 
I had a person tell me recently, he said, well, I, you, you just don't use enough scripture in your, in your sermon. And I'm sorry. But you see, this is the message, isn't it? This is what he's talking about. And the whole idea really goes back to the title of the message, and that is what? Could you repeat it with me? Be prepared. And somebody else cannot do that for you. I like a little story that went something like this, that uh, when, when Columbus sailed to America, they spent many weeks on the, on the water, and they, they didn't have any idea, uncharted sea that was there. And the circumstances led this crew to the point of saying, we're going to go back. And they waited and waited for a little while. And then all of a sudden, they saw this, this stuff, all of this, uh, these pieces of wood and, and things that were on the west side. And they looked and they saw what was happening. They were almost there. And in a way, I think that we're in a position like that. In every generation, when we look at it, God has sent some sign of his coming. Don't you think? He sent some sign of his coming of Jesus to the Christians. The fact that we, we so that we do not, what, lose hope. And this is one of the things that I think is so important for us as Christians, that we do not lose hope. It would be easy to do, in a sense, as we look at our world now. Be saying, ah, what, I am with you. And I love the end of one of the passages that says what? Go ye therefore and teach all nations what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. To take the hope that I give you. There's still something there. I will be with you. And there's nothing that I enjoy more. Now there, I'll tell you what, there are a couple of things that make me really, really happy. And I won't say this is number one. But one of the things that I find very, very important, and I know I've mentioned this lady by the name of Mitzi once in a while, but one of the things that is so good for me is when she and I are together. The other is when I know, which I do know, that God is with me. I do know that God is here. Not because of our goodness, but because of his love for us. I was reading a little paper the other day, and it, I, it was a book that I have on my bookshelf that I had never read. And I don't know why I did it, but I opened to this one particular page, and something happened. There was a phrase there, and it was a simple one that talked about sin and forgiveness of sin. This writer said, be careful that when you have asked God for the forgiveness of your sin, that you don't continue to live with it, to remember it, to let it de defeat you, and so on. And how many times have we done this? Because the statement that he finally made, he said, if God has forgiven it, it does not exist. And you think in our forgiveness, when we were born again, when we became a Christian, our sins were forgiven and started over. There was no sin. God had nothing against us. And that is an extremely important part of our lives. And I like the closings hymn that we have this morning, which is number 350. This is one that is, is so important. I, I know that everybody here is, is a Christian, but let, let's think about this particular hymn. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus for him to be with us every day. Let's stand as we sing this hymn. Just the first verse of the this morning.
Lord, as we leave this place, your house, we do so with the, the knowledge and the emotion that you are with us. I pray that you will guide each of us in the decisions that we make, the things that we do, our thoughts, and that which we give to our lives, to our family, to our community. May these be very deep in our relationship to Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that you will help us to not be afraid because you are here. Be with us, guide us. Thank you for the promise so that we are prepared. Be with us now as we go to our homes. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Praise God from you, all blessings flow.